Chag Sameach, everyone. The subject of today's session is returning to the biblical holy days. And of course, I've made this point many times in the past, but it's always an important point to stress, in particular, when we embark upon these sessions. We often refer to these days as Jewish holidays. And of course, I admit they are. Jews have been celebrating them, certainly in the case of Passover, since before Sinai, since the Passover. But simultaneously, I prefer to refer to them as biblical holy days because while God specifically obligates Israel in keeping these festivals, obviously, just as all the words of the Bible are meaningful and have a message for everyone who believes in the Bible, Certainly these days, irrespective of the extent to which one who is not part of Israel may choose to integrate observances of these days into his or her life, these days certainly have a message. And that's precisely what we'd like to explore, because the message of Passover on manifold planes, undoubtedly applies to everyone who believes in the words of the Bible. Obviously, we're not going to exhaust the subject of Passover today, and we've had a number of sessions in the past on the subject of Passover as well, but I would like to focus upon what, from my perspective, is perhaps one of the most foundational messages, and one that certainly has vast implications with respect to everyone, Jew and non-Jew, who believes that the Bible is here to teach us, to guide us in our lives. So, on that note, we begin with Exodus chapter 13, with verses 7 and 8, which I think have a clear message, first on the most basic plane, with respect to what we're supposed to do on Passover. Beginning in verse 7, unleavened bread shall be eaten throughout the seven days, and there shall be no leavened bread be seen with you, and neither shall there be leaven seen with you in all your borders. And you shall tell your son in that day, saying, It is because of that which God did for me when I came forth out of Egypt. So here's a message, and I'll note at the outset, this is something to which we will yet have occasion to return, that there are a number of sons and a number of messages for sons that we read in the Torah, specifically with respect to Passover. What is most relevant for our purposes today is this is what you're supposed to be saying because of that which God did for me. For me. When I came forth out of Egypt. And indeed, in our tradition, the manner in which this verse is understood is extremely literal. We each, from the time of the Exodus and on, say to our children, this is what God did for me when I came forth out of Egypt. Now, as I'm sure you're well aware, I didn't come out of Egypt. I'm not that old. And I suspect that 
very few of you would be able to literally state to your children that you came forth out of Egypt either. There are those who can say literally that they came forth out of Egypt. That is, there used to, of course, be a thriving Jewish community in Egypt as a result of the establishment of the state of Israel they were turned into refugees of what had been their own homeland. Something that happened, of course, throughout the Arab world, where Jewish communities that had predated Islam by centuries were wiped off the map of the course of just a few short years or less. And hundreds of thousands became refugees. You know, uh, nowadays it is in vogue to speak of one set of refugees that resulted from the establishment of the State of Israel. This corresponding set of refugees is usually all but ignored. I'm just noting this in passing. There are individuals who really can state that they came forth out of Egypt. But of course, returning to the important bottom line here, most of us cannot. So how are we supposed to actualize this mandate, this mandate that God gives us here in Exodus chapter 13, verse 8? To be able to say that this is what God did for me when I came forth out of Egypt. It's not merely acting. It's not merely role playing. It's true that there are indeed many Jewish communities in which there has traditionally been a whole dramatization in which the parents, the leaders of the Passover say there, actually act out coming out of Egypt. But I think we can readily appreciate that the principal thrust of this mandate is a state of mind to relive an experience, to relive it with such seriousness with such vitality that you really feel you came forth out of Egypt. A mandate for us all. Now, of course, I'm stressing this as our starting point because as undoubtedly you are aware, this mandate, seeing yourself as coming forth out of Egypt is one of the foundational principles in what we do at the Passover Seder. And of course, inevitably, what it entails is celebrating the liberation, feeling the exodus, feeling that we are redeemed by God right now. And that is, of course, one part of the story, a very part of the story, important part of the story, undoubtedly. But it's not the whole story. Because together with this emphasis here on reliving the experience of the exodus, of the redemption, there are a number of passages in particular in Deuteronomy that speak of the importance of remembering not the good news about redemption, about liberation, but rather very much on the contrary the suffering, the slavery, the bondage. And this is a theme recurrent on manifold planes in the Torah to begin 
with Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 14. And you shall remember that you were a servant in the land of Egypt. Likewise, in chapter 15, verse 15, you shall remember you were bondman, a servant in the land of Egypt. The same thing in Deuteronomy chapter 16. And again, in chapter 24, verses 18 and 22, remembering that we were servants in Egypt. This isn't celebrating liberation. This isn't reliving the Exodus. This is suffering. This is bondage. And inevitably, there's a tension between these two mandates that the Torah is giving us. I wouldn't describe it as a contradiction, but they're pulling in different directions. Are we focusing upon the good times, being redeemed by God? Or are we focusing on everything else, on the suffering, on the slavery, on the bondage, on everything bad before the light of God's redemption shone upon us. And uh, on some plane, I think inevitably we recognize where the answer must lie. And indeed, it is in a way expressed in one of the central mandates of the way we are to observe the Passover expressed in Exodus chapter 12, verse 8, the paschal offering is to be eaten with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Now, the unleavened bread, ostensibly, and we'll soon see support for this presumption, is a symbol of liberation. The bitter herbs, a symbol of bitterness. You need both. You need them both together in order to properly fulfill the responsibility of the Passover. Indeed, in that second Passover that is provided for individuals who miss the first opportunity to bring the Paschal offering in Numbers chapter 9, verse 11, the essential aspects of the offering need to be maintained. And here, once again, God emphasizes, you shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Because both together need to be there. There's the bad and the good. And truth be told, besides the extent to which both of them are present as respectively symbolized by the unleavened bread, the matzah, and the bitter herbs. In the matzah itself, in the unleavened bread, we see a kind of internal contradiction. That is, as I already noted, and undoubtedly, this is our natural expectation, the symbolism of the unleavened bread is a symbolism of liberation. As we read in Exodus chapter 12, verse 39, and they baked unleavened cakes of the dough which they brought forth out of Egypt, for it was not leavened because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not tarry, neither had they prepared for themselves any victual. So the haste of redemption is reflected in the unleavened bread that didn't have a chance to rise. And yet, a very different motif appears in Deuteronomy, in chapter 16, where we read once again of the Passover offering. And in particular, in verse 3, we read, you shall eat no leavened bread with it, with the Passover offering. Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread with it, the bread of affliction. 
So the matzah, the unleavened bread here, is considered not a symbolism for liberation, but on the contrary, a symbolism for affliction, for the bondage itself. Now, in truth, the continuation of the verse stands in stark contrast to speaking of the bread of affliction, the continuation of the verse, for in haste, you did come forth out of the land of Egypt. And of course, in speaking of the haste, it is manifestly re-invoking the themes that we already saw expressed explicitly in Exodus chapter 12, verse 39, that it was not leaven because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not tarry. But if anything, that just highlights how strange it is to identify the matzah, the unleavened bread, in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 3, as the bread of affliction. If the continuation of the verse says, for in haste you came forth out of the land of Egypt, we would expect the unleavened bread to be identified here as the bread of haste, the bread of liberation. Why the bread of affliction? And here we get a sense of maybe not just simply attention, but almost in a way, what strikes us as a contradiction. What is the matzah? Is it the bread of affliction? Or is it the bread of liberation? After all, we would think, wouldn't we? It's not both. Uh, but then maybe it is. Maybe just as we are bidden on the one hand to relive the exodus, to relive the liberation, but on the other hand, we are also bidden to remember the bondage. There really is a requirement, a surprising requirement, an extraordinary requirement to integrate here two seemingly polar opposites, affliction and liberation, slavery and redemption, the bad times and the good times. And rather than regard one as being our sole focus, we need to focus on them both. Which, of course, inevitably raises the question, why? And in the time that we have, I think it's going to be our mission to try to answer that question. Why, indeed, is both the affliction and the liberation central to what we need to do on Passover? Why are both of these themes necessarily the objects of our attention? As with many questions of this sort, there are obviously going to be multiple answers. I'd like to present four different answers to the question, where these four different answers amount to, I think, layers, one built upon the one that comes before it. And perhaps through these various layers, we can successively get a deeper and deeper appreciation of what the message of Passover is, what the point of Passover is for each of us. So, why both? Why remembering the bondage and remembering the liberation? Why, if you will, the bitter herbs together with the matzah, the unleavened bread? Why, in the unleavened bread itself, is there the motif of hurrying out of Egypt toward liberation and simultaneously also 
the bread of affliction. Level number one. Level number one is a pretty much inescapable realization. And that is, if we're going to be intellectually honest, we need to consider the redemption not as an isolated event. We need to see the exodus as the culmination of a historical process. If we close our eyes to everything that came before the Exodus, the Exodus itself becomes an event that is unanchored and that is, in a way, even meaningless because we don't understand within what context it's taking place. So the first level is simply the intellectual honesty, the integrity of recognizing that there is such a historical process unfolding here. Everything, both the affliction and the redemption, everything takes a part in this story. But of course, ultimately, that answer is inadequate because we recognize we aren't here as historians. And that brings us to level number two. Level number two realizing after all that our recalling the exodus is precisely because we are striving to establish a relationship with god it's not a subject of academic interest it's a subject of interest to us as human beings who are reaching out to god to that divine source of not just the exodus but of everything including us then in order for us to really be able to appreciate what the exodus signifies we need to place it in the context of why we needed it the crying out to god in our suffering in the bondage all the bad that ultimately underlies our appreciation of what the Exodus signified. All of that is critical if the Exodus is going to have the role that we crave in enabling us to connect with God. So, of course, inevitably, then, that's level number two. It's not just a matter of intellectual honesty, it's a matter of striving for a relationship, it's a matter of building this kind of a dynamism of connecting with God, connecting with the divine. And in particular, of course, in this regard, you realize you can't appreciate a solution if you don't really feel how awful the problem was. It's by remembering the bondage, by experiencing the affliction that you can really appreciate what God did in bringing us forth. Now, this theme of appreciating the solution only because you recognize that you have a problem is something with which I'm sure in particular, everyone who is an educator, which of course includes everyone who's a parent, can very readily sense, you know, that if you are trying to impress something upon your students, if they don't feel there's a problem that what you're going to tell them will solve, you'll accomplish nothing. Because after all, there as well, in order for them to appreciate your solution, your lesson, they need to appreciate that they have a problem that needs to be solved. And of course, inevitably, I'm stressing this point. This is kind of um, 2B, second level, but a sub-level of level number two, because what I am intimating here plays such a critical role in what we do, in particular, at the Passover Seder, 
It's really something that pertains to the process of education generally. But the Passover say there is perhaps the most vivid archetype of what education ought to be. Note how repeatedly the Torah stresses how the memory of the Exodus is to be conveyed to successive generations. First, in Exodus chapter 12, we see it here in verse 26, and it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, what mean you by this service? And there's a statement that on some plane is intended to be a response to the inquiry. And of course, that's not the only place where we find this exchange of questions and answers. Well, we already noted with respect to the children, this was one of the verses with which we began. In Exodus chapter 13, verse 8, you shall tell your son in that day, saying, is because of that which God did for me when I came forth out of Egypt. Admittedly, this son isn't asking a question, but the other ones are. In verse 14, and it shall be when your son asks you in time to come, saying, what is this? That you shall say unto him, by strength of hand, God brought us forth from Egypt, from the house of bondage, and so on. And once again, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, when your son asks you in time to come, saying, what mean the testimonies, the statutes, and the ordinances which God, our Lord, has commanded you, then you shall say unto your son, we were Pharaoh's servants in Egypt, as bondmen, and God brought us forth from Egypt with a mighty hand. And of course, once again, what's critical here is the question and answer format. As many are undoubtedly aware, we have in our tradition a reckoning here of four different sons who are represented in the Torah's admonition to us as to how to teach the Exodus to succeeding generations. Now, three of them explicitly ask questions. The fourth doesn't, and to the extent that the fourth doesn't, he gets a special title, the one who doesn't know enough to ask a question, which implies that questions and answers really should be playing a central role in the proceedings. And of course, anyone who has ever been present at a Passover Seder knows very well just how central that role of questions and answers is. Of course, formally, at the beginning of the Seder, the youngest typically is the one who asks the questions that then subsequently get answered. But it's very important for me to stress here. In a traditional Seder, that's by no means the only exchange of questions and answers. And I can speak personally at our Seder a few days ago. We began the say there at 8 o'clock in the evening, after the evening service, and um, we finished around 3 o'clock in the morning. A lot of questions, a lot of questions, a lot of answers, a lot of discussion, always to recognize there's a problem and to strive to come up with a solution to it. It's a process. And it's a process, again, in appreciating just what the solution will signify. It's not simply a matter of level one intellectual honesty. It's a matter of level two, the need to establish a relationship. And um, that brings us to an additional dimension. And we move on in this vein to level number three, that it's not simply that there were bad times and after the bad times ended the good times began this is teaching us something far more holistic one could say cosmic about the nature of reality in this world what our lives are all about this is an idea that we have had occasion to discuss previously indeed we discussed it with respect to Genesis chapter 1. The recurrent theme that we find throughout 
Genesis chapter 1, at the end of each of the days of creation, and there was evening and there was morning. Verse 5, and there was evening and there was morning in verse 8. Likewise in verse 13 and in 19 and in 23. And finally, at the end of the six days of creation, God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. But as you may recall, we focus not merely on the expression and there was evening and there was morning, but also on the words themselves. Where, of course, by the words themselves, I don't mean the words evening and morning. I mean the words that actually appear in the Torah, which are, of course, respectively, Erev and Boker. Now, Erev and Boker unequivocally are well translated as evening and morning. But it's always important for us to discern the three-letter etymological root of the word. We've noted again this in the past, that the root letters of Erev Ein, Reish, Bet, Le'arev means to mix, to become confused, to lack the resolution of structure, of order. As opposed to Boker, the root letter is Bet, Kuf, Reish. That means discerning, distinguishing. Now, of course, very obviously, when we speak of evening and morning on a purely optical level, we understand very well. When it's evening, images become confused with one another. You can't see clearly because it's getting dark. And when morning comes, you can discern once again. You can distinguish one thing from another. So, in a very literal sense, Erev does signify mixing together, and Bokeh signifies distinguishing and discernment. Mm -hmm. But on a deeper plane, in the process of creation, this, after all, was manifestly the case. The whole process was really primarily not one of creation. The verb create appears in only three contexts in the narrative in chapter one, the focus isn't so much on creating, but rather on differentiating, on separating, on discerning. The world starts out on manifold planes, disorganized, chaotic. Things aren't clear. We don't understand. And there's a process. It's a historical process. It's not merely to observe that in the Exodus it happened this way. It always happens this way. That from a state of disorder, ultimately, we attain discernment. We attain clarity. From bondage, redemption. This in another sense, is expressed in Psalm 92, verse 3. To declare your loving kindness, God, in the morning, and your faithfulness in the night seasons. Again, morning. Morning signifies not only literal morning here, clearly. Those times in life when we can declare God's loving kindness because we can see it, because we can sense it, because everything is clear. It's light outside. As opposed to the night seasons when we need to be sustained by faithfulness because nothing is clear. Well, in the actual progression of life, the clarity only comes after the disorganized, frightening realm of darkness. And so, level number three is the realization that everything we said before in levels one and two applies not merely to the Exodus, but rather to the totality of life itself. That 
inherent in the reality of this world is a progression. If you're only going to focus on the mornings, if you're only going to focus on clarity, if you're only going to focus on redemption, on exodus, you're going to miss the point of life. Because just as in creation, it was imperative to stress, first there was the evening. In life itself, there's always the darkness before you get to the dawn. And with that, we progress to level number four. Level number four, with the realization that not only are both the darkness and the light present ubiquitously in our lives, there is an unseverable bond between them. Because, of course, inevitably, they both come from one source, the one source. There's only one source in God. So that our dichotomy between the bad and the good isn't artificial. It's something we really feel vividly in our lives, but maybe it tends to be somewhat superficial. And maybe at times it simply reflects the fact that we don't get to see the whole picture. We have had occasion in the past to discuss Exodus chapter 5, and I think it is a particularly telling illustration of this principle. What happens in Exodus chapter 5? Moses comes before Pharaoh to petition Pharaoh for allowing Israel to go, and does he accomplish anything? Well, something is accomplished. It clearly is not what Moses had in mind. What's accomplished, of course, is that Pharaoh issues a new edict. We read it here in Exodus chapter 5, verse 7. You shall no more give the people straw to make brick as heretofore. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. And the tail, the tally of the bricks which they did make heretofore, you shall lay upon them, you shall not diminish aught thereof. And all of a sudden, the suffering that was so dreadful, so awful, becomes that much worse. Because now, instead of merely having to do the brick making and brick laying, they also have to do the straw gathering. And they still need to reach the same tally of bricks, which of course is impossible. And this is Pharaoh's decree. Let heavier work be laid upon the men that they may labor therein. And so we read in verse 12, so the people were scattered abroad throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. And it was terrible. However miserable Israel was until then, things just became incalculably worse. We read in verse 14, the officers of the children of Israel whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them were beaten because they weren't delivering enough bricks. And the situation had gone again from miserable to impossible. So awful that not only do the Israelites blame Moses for the worsening situation that is as the officers of the children of Israel express it in verse 21 may God look upon you and judge because you have made our savor to be abhorred in the eyes of Pharaoh and, the, and in the eyes of his servants to put sword in their hand to slay us not only did they challenge Moses. Moses himself doesn't understand what's happening. Moses himself practically challenges God. 
And Moses returned unto God and said, Lord, wherefore have you dealt ill with this people? Why is it that you have sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has dealt ill with this people. Neither have you delivered your people at all. What are you doing? So again, of course, on the face of it, if I were to ask you, Exodus chapter 5, good times or bad times? You'd probably give me a pathetic smile and say, what a stupid question. Bad times, terrible times, couldn't be worse. But now, of course, I need to remind you of the way we view Exodus chapter 5 in our ancient traditions. That when Exodus chapter 5 is taking place, the decree has already been decreed. I don't talk about Pharaoh here. I mean, God's decree. Egypt is going to be brought to its knees. The plagues are about to be unleashed in all their fury, except, except, ironically, God, as it were, has a problem. The problem is that when the plagues strike, all the Egyptians will be bearing the brunt of the plagues, and they are liable to complain, Pharaoh sinned, and we have to suffer? And that complaint that is, as it were, an affront to divine justice is holding back the process of redemption from moving forward until, you know, in chapter 5, verse 12, we saw the people scattered abroad throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw, which, of course, inevitably raises the question, why do they have to scatter so far in order to gather stubble for straw? Stubble, after all, is everywhere. Anywhere where a field had been harvested, what's left behind is stubble. And it's ownerless because the owner of the field doesn't care. He's not going to use that stubble for anything. So why do they have to scatter abroad all over in order to gather the stubble? And the answer, because... The moment one of the Israelites would come into an Egyptian's field to take this ownerless stubble in order to be able to make the bricks, the Egyptians would come running after them, beat them up, chase them out of the field. You're not coming into my field to get stubble. And of course, that was the reason that Exodus chapter 5 describes such misery. They couldn't even get the stubble they needed. Such awful suffering. Such a worsening of the miserable bondage that they had endured until now. Yeah, but you notice the last impediment to redemption had been the tacit Egyptian claim, we're innocent. It's all Pharaoh's fault. Not anymore. Now they're all guilty. That what Exodus chapter 5 describes is the misery that was inflicted gratuitously on all of Israel by Egyptians who had nothing to lose but weren't prepared to show one iota of compassion on these miserable slaves just looking to gather ownerless stubble. And because of the straw, the uh, last straw, as it were, that was preventing the plagues from being unleash unleashed in all their fury has been removed. And now the redemption 
will indeed move inexorably toward its culmination. So, you know, once you have this perspective on Exodus chapter 5, if I now ask the same question again, is Exodus chapter 5 describing the bad or the good? Is it part of a description of the misery of bondage, or is it part of the description of the lead-up to redemption? Not such a simple question to answer anymore. Really, inevitably, it's both. And of course, that, after all, is precisely the point. Both the bad and the good are part of God's plan. Both come from him. I'm reminded of a story that I heard a number of years ago here in Jerusalem that I have shared with some of you in the past. I'm told it's true. A story that begins in North America and concludes here in Jerusalem. A big burly biker on his motorcycle riding on a steep mountain road and as he rounds the bend he sees there is an 18-wheeler tractor trailer bearing right down upon him. And it's a narrow road. And he has no place to go. On the one side is the side of the mountain. On the other side of the road is a cliff all the way into the abyss. He can't attempt to avert the collision by going either right or left. And in the seconds before that collision, for the first time ever in his entire life, he turned to God. God, if you get me out of this alive, I'm yours. Well, he was badly hurt, very badly hurt. In the hospital for months, and then afterwards in rehabilitation. But he survived. And ultimately, he was back on his feet. And he remembered those last words, those last fateful words, what he promised God. And he came here to Jerusalem to one of the religious seminaries that has grown over the years, catering in particular to people coming from non-religious backgrounds but who are returning to God, and presented himself to the headmaster of this seminary and told him his story. He said to him, Rabbi, I'm keeping my word. I'm giving myself over to God. I'm here. And the rabbi responded, well, you're certainly completely welcome to stay here and delve into your identity, your faith, your connection with God. But before you make that decision, I just want you to realize that the same God who saved you is the one who sent the truck. I think it takes a lot of courage to confront a person with that realization. But of course, from our perspective, it's the truth. There is no other source after all. It all comes from God. And so, when we realize that everything is coming from God, that line that separates between the bad and the good starts to get a little bit blurry. They're all different aspects of how God is communicating with us. The bread of affliction is indeed the bread of liberation. 
Now, in practice, I should just add here, you know, if we ask ourselves, how can the bread of affliction be bread of liberation? I'll share with you in brief a few answers, maybe just to make things a little bit more concrete. One answer that is proposed is, well, the matzah, the unleavened bread, is a good diet for slaves, for prisoners, because it really sticks inside a person. So it was the same bread that really was the bread of affliction that afterward became the bread of liberation. Another possibility that maybe brings these two motifs closer together is that for slaves, slaves who don't have control over their time, who are always running because they need to obey someone else, for slaves, the unleavened bread that doesn't rise is an asset precisely because their time is not their own. And it's the self-same identity of the unleavened bread that doesn't have time to rise that made it appropriate as the bread of redemption. When the reason that there wasn't time was because the redemption happened so swiftly. So the swiftness, the haste that had been one of the trappings of bondage, of suffering, of slavery, becomes the swiftness, the haste of redemption. Another possibility, this is an idea that is advanced by one of the foremost Jewish thinkers really of all time, lived in the 16th century, Rabbi Judah Leva of Prague, also known as the Maharal of Prague, who notes that the Hebrew bread of affliction, lechem oni, means bread of impoverishment, in that it's the simplest substance imaginable that can be called bread. It's just flour and water. Simplicity. No extra trappings. No leaven. No extra ingredients. Nothing. The bread of impoverishment. But, you know, ironically, returning to the basics, returning to simplicity, means not being beholden to all of those extras where all those extras, in varying degrees, end up demanding of us our submission, our allegiance, when you return to the simplicity, the basics of the bread of impoverishment. Ironically, you strip yourself of these crutches. You strip yourself of these encumbrances that subordinate you. And you're left all alone, just with God. Which is precisely what liberation, what redemption is all about. Because nothing else matters. Just you with God. So the bread of impoverishment, of affliction, really is the bread of liberation. Once you're able to discern in the affliction, in the impoverishment itself, the germination of liberation, then you're getting to level four. It's not the bad versus the good. It's getting the deeper level of insight that enables us to understand how everything ultimately is part of that process that flows directly from God. We see the same idea, in a way, expressed in Jeremiah chapter 31, in describing the redemption of the future. 
He that scattered Israel, we read in verse 9, does gather him. The scatterer is God. The gatherer, also God. These are simply two reflections of the same reality. And keep him as a shepherd does his flock. Verse 10, for God has redeemed Jacob, and he redeemed him from the hand of him that is stronger than he. And I'm going to focus in particular on the end of verse 12. Then the virgin will rejoice in the dance, and young men and old men together, for I will turn their mourning into joy, and will comfort them, and make them rejoice. And now here we have the final words of the verse, translated here as from their sorrow. Except as you can see, I'm proposing an alternative translation. In the Hebrew, the last words of the verse I will turn their mourning into joy and console them and comfort them and make them rejoice. Now, as in all prepositional phrases in Hebrew, is a word that indicates the preposition as a prefix. The mem, mi yigonam. And it could be translated as, I will make them rejoice from their sorrow. But there's an alternative meaning. That mem, preposition, could also mean because of, through. And I must admit that I think that's far closer to the simple, straightforward meaning of Jeremiah's words. Because after all, the previous part of the verse, I will turn their mourning into joy. It's not forget about the morning. No, no, no. It's the morning itself becomes the joy. That's what comforts them. And it is the sorrow itself that serves as the basis of making them to rejoice. So, is the sorrow part of the bad or part of the good? Or should we simply say, they're both part of what comes from God. Because, as we've noted on many occasions, God, after all, is the source of everything. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 7, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I am God that does all these things. In Amos chapter 3, verse 6, Shall evil befall a city? And God has not done it. In Lamentations chapter 3, verse 38, out of the mouth of the Most High proceed not evil and good. Everything comes from Him. So it becomes a bit shallow to talk about bad versus good when both the bad and the good have their source in God. And that really inevitably is at the foundation of how we relate to the Exodus, because after all, apropos of what the rabbi said to the biker, you realize that the God who saved you is also the God who sent the 18 wheeler tractor trailer. Uh, sure, God saved us from bondage in Egypt. Who put us there in the first place? Remember Genesis chapter 15. God says to Abraham in verse 13, Know of a surety that your seed will be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. That's from God, no less than the following verse, and also the nation that they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. Both are from God. If we wouldn't recognize that they're both from God, inevitably we'd have to ask, so, why do we have to experience the bondage in the first place? And if we won't realize that the bad is there because ultimately it really is part of the process of the good of God's salvation, 
we're still going to be asking. So couldn't God just leave us alone and not give us the bondage, nor the salvation? But both what we're calling bad and what we're calling good are really together reflections of what God is communicating to us. I feel in particular compelled to share with you with respect to the Exodus itself, a thought of one of the profound thinkers of the last century, Rabbi Abraham Isaac HaKohen Cook, the first chief rabbi in British mandatory Palestine in the land of Israel, who in considering the interplay between the bondage and the liberation makes the observation, well, obviously, on so many levels, the bondage is a terrible, terrible thing. So much suffering, so much anguish, so much heartache, children being thrown into the Nile. We're not coming in any way to minimize that suffering, to minimize that heartache, to minimize the evil of bondage. And yet, we acquired some very important, great substance through the bondage too. Because, you know, through bondage, you learn perforce to subordinate yourself to something else that's greater than you. And isn't that one of the most important prerequisites of being able to stand at Mount Sinai and accept God's Torah guiding us in our lives? I mean, after all, with all due respect to the common portrayal of what Moses goes to Pharaoh to say, he does not go to Pharaoh saying, let my people go. It's always that he may serve me. Exodus chapter 4, verse 23, at the outset, let my son go that he may serve me. In chapter 5, verse 1, let my people go that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And repeatedly, through all the plagues, let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. Again and again, throughout, continuously. Indeed, I argue that perhaps a better translation than let my people go would be send my people forth. Send them. Because I have a mission for them. And all these years of bondage have prepared them for that mission. So yes, of course, on manifold planes, it's the bad times. It's the suffering, it's the anguish, it's the misery. But it's also the beginning of a process that comes from God. Not just in the end. From the beginning, it's all from God. It's all God showing us the way we just need to lead, dig, dig a little more deeply and see how it's all God's gifts. Some gifts that are terrifying. Some gifts that are gratifying. But ultimately, all of them showing us a deeper understanding of how our relationship with God guides our lives, both what to our eyes is the bad and what to our eyes is the good. And that brings me to the conclusion of all this. In the prophecy of Micha, chapter 7, verse 8, we read, Rejoice not against me, O my enemy, when I am fallen, I am arisen. When I sit in darkness, God is a light unto me. And in our tradition, appended to this verse, as it were, is the realization 
if I were not fallen, I would not have arisen. If I were not sitting in darkness, God would not be my light. So the falling, the darkness, are they bad? Well, in a way, but the falling is the basis of the rising and the darkness is the basis of God being a light unto me. The greatest gift of all. In a similar vein, in Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16, for a righteous man falls seven times and rises up again, but the wicked stumbles in evil. So, of course, we can read this verse that the righteous man falls seven times, and yet, nevertheless, he rises up. The wicked just stumble and, and stay there. But, of course, based upon what we just saw, there is so much deeper a message. The righteous man falls seven times, but has the perseverance, the dedication, the commitment, the foresight, the insight to transform each of those falls into a rise. Because he falls, he rises. Just as in the words of Micha, because I was fallen, I was arisen. Because I was sitting in darkness, God was my light. Because the righteous falls, he rises ever higher. The wicked, because of his evil, simply stumbles and remains sprawled in the dirt. Because he lacks that dedication, that perseverance, that commitment, that devotion. To transform every fall, every bad time into a new beginning. And ultimately, the verse with which we conclude. At the beginning of Isaiah chapter 12, in that day, you will say, this is in the final redemption. I will give thanks unto you, O God. For though you were angry with me, when your anger is turned away, you comfort me. I thought I experienced anger. I thought you had smitten me. But when your anger is turned away, I realize you're really comforting me. And all the things that I saw only as bad were the darkness before the dawn. And the bad times aren't merely what precede the good times. It's not just a matter of the intellectual honesty of recognizing that one came first and then came the other. And it's not simply a matter of a kind of general relationship of recognizing that we appreciate God's salvation more when we appreciate where we came from before. And it's not simply a matter either of recognizing that this is the nature of the world. It's recognizing that it's all part of an ongoing dialogue between us and God. It's all part of how God speaks to us. It's all part of that process of redemption. When you recognize that, then you have the capacity to be able to say, I will give thanks for you were angry with me. Because that's all part of the way you speak to me and ultimately the way you save me. And therefore, behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and I will not be afraid. That, perhaps more than anything else, is the message of salvation, of liberation, of redemption. That's the message of reliving the Exodus. Reliving the Exodus, not just 
the good times. Reliving the exodus together with reliving the bondage, the suffering, the anguish, everything. Reliving, being, from the bad, through to the good, always, in the ultimate good, God's presence. God bless you. And Chag Sameach.